Okay, um, as mentioned, this is uh, one of uh, several projects which was commissioned by Historic England, forming English Heritage under the NHP activity Major Environmental Threats. Uh, ours was catchily named Preparing Emergency Services and their Partners for Disaster Planning with Respect to Heritage Assets Projects. That's one of our skills in Worcestershire. Rubbish acronyms. So, this has been another partnership project from strength of this activity, I feel. Uh, one is a Worcestershire Archive and Archaeology Service. We led this. Uh, as I said, my name is Jack Hansen. I am uh, now the former landscape officer in Worcestershire. I've gone into another job, not as a result of this project, I assure you. But um, And we've been undertaking it in partnership with Andy Howard, who you saw last up from Landscape Research and Management. Funded by Historic England, and uh, it was a very kind of uh, diverse project in a lot of ways. Uh, to give you some definitions there, when we talk about emergency services, we're not just talking about you know, kind of uh, police, fire, rescue. Uh, we're talking about a very broad uh, range of services that have to respond very rapidly uh, to issues of flooding. So whether that be the environment agency or the local authority, or indeed those kind of, you know, first response emergency services. So what I'm going to do today is talk about one aspect of that. And there's very little point in going over the whole project, as it would be, you know, kind of uh, very vague and very rapid. And I'll. Uh, I'll come to that in a little bit of time, but it is worth me initially giving you a bit of an overview of you know, the, the broader project, what the kind of philosophies and objectives were, and how we've come to some of these conclusions. So the, the broad objectives, uh, number one, was to better understand the direct threats from flooding to the historic environment, so direct impacts from flood water, and, uh, um, and the indirect impacts, so impacts from measures of mitigation, from adaption, from response, repair, recovery. We want to critically assess how local authorities, how statutory agencies um, and specialists within governmental and statutory bodies are uh, engaging with these processes and engaging with the various stakeholders involved. And through looking at those processes, uh, it was important that we garnered a greater understanding of the capacities and the perspectives of those individuals to deal with heritage and to deal with historic environment from a non-heritage background. We wanted to produce new guidance for those individuals to improve the way they, they did those and uh, identify new means and methodologies and mechanisms through a way that whole process could be improved for the betterment of the historic environment. So, we came out with a range of pro uh, products. Um, first and foremost, uh, with kind of at the top level, is a paper led by Andy Howard uh, titled um, Broadly Detailed Analysis of Challenges Facing the Heritage Community in Response to Changing Catchment Hydrology, Climate Change, um, and Climate Change, again under the catchy title from Worcester Archive and Archaeology Service. But that was looking at things from a kind of national and pan-European perspective. And then we came in as Worcester Archive and Archaeology Service and started to drill it down into that real local level of local authority and statutory agency. So as part of that, as mentioned, we produced a range of guidance documents. So there's bespoke documents for members of the public, for property owners, for uh, what we call partners, so other individuals within local authorities, whether it be planners or ecologists, uh, and those for uh, historic environment specialists like yourselves about how you can access particular information and how best to engage with various parties. The third product um, was a, 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 the critical, a critical analysis of the historic environment sector, and we achieved that through three case studies, one of which I'll be talking about today. So those three case studies, number one, led by Robin Jackson, who's just at the back there, give us a wave, there he is, no, he's being shy, there he is. <laughs> and that was, um, it was looking, really trying to find lessons in good practice uh, for the design, the planning and the implementation of um, archaeological works in response to flood risk management. Uh, looking at how archaeologists are engaged or disengaged with those frameworks from throughout that process. Trying to find ways in which we can, uh, you know, better be involved in the early stages of those processes and how that can inform better archaeological mitigation uh, works and research through the whole process. That was done through an examination of a number of case studies across Worcestershire. The second uh, was looking at developing a geospatial methodology, uh, very much based on the SHINE initiative uh, from Natural England, uh, for use by curators of historic environment information, so predominantly HERs, um, how they can synthesise and simplify that information uh, for more rapid and useful um, kind of application by those non-heritage professionals. Fundamentally providing a product which people who had to respond rapidly to these events could identify key environmental risk, key environmental opportunity and um, key constraints 
and effectively facilitate greater engagement between themselves and ourselves as the curators. And the third, which is what I'll be talking about today, um, was a critical analysis of uh, our practices in response to at-risk communities and at-risk owners of properties. So really looking at how resilient they are to flooding and what means through which they're engaging with the preservation of their buildings. So that's really what, we're, what I'll be focusing on. So the role of this, uh, the objectives, was to critically assess the varying roles of property owners, local authorities and statutory agencies in managing change, managing change to historic built assets. And go further than that and examine how, what our practices and principles are doing to, you know, to kind of uh, perpetuate any issues or to kind of find any solutions. We wanted to identify the key issues, the key challenges, and importantly, uh, explore opportunities to improve those. And then finally provide those recommendations to Historic England. Now, the reason for this, it sounds quite broad scale, but the reason for this was quite pressing within Worcestershire. And this is really where the kind of genesis of this project came from is that in Worcestershire we have a huge range of highly at-risk settlements with villages and towns within those floodplains, obviously um, commonly immediately adjacent to you know, flooding watercourses. It has an enormous economic and social impact and it puts a, you know, a huge variety of our heritage at risk across the scales of designation, across the scales of significance, of the, across the scales of form and morphologies. Now, because of that, because of the breadth of that risk, the primary curators and the primary individuals who are responsible for the conservation of those assets are the people that own them. We do not have the capacity to deliver the breadth of advice and, in, and kind, of, uh, kind of involvement that's required. So these individuals lead and are primarily responsible for these repairs. Now, we can talk about our sex for all we want, but it's vital that we understand how they are engaging with it, because otherwise we only talk about exemplars. We're trying to look at the commonplace, the day-to-day, -day, and the kind of the breadth of issues facing people that own the properties. These are the most important people in these processes. But we have, or we had, a poor understanding of, what, of that status quo, of how they were going about this, what, way, what kind of processes they were going through, who they were talking to, what knowledge they were requiring, and what major challenges they were facing. Now this is really important, and hugely important, because if we, and what we believe is happening, if they're not appropriately informed by those of a heritage vocation, that the changes that occur are going to be relatively ill-informed. You're not going to have designed, which is heritage-led, which is led by the, the, uh, the key constraints, the key opportunities of that particular building. And that's a real threat to architectural conservation, of sustainability, to local economy and local amenity. And it has a massive impact. And really, the, the idea of this was to quantify that issue. It is, I get it, it is a very kind of issues-focused paper, so I apologise about that, but we'll come back around some opportunities later on. Right, so how did we do this? It was a programme of community outreach, community engagement, with various stages. A uh, written questionnaire went out to a range of um, owners of historic properties. Uh, the five localities were targeted, um, five at-risk localities. Um, within there, we targeted pre-1920 buildings that were within the Environment Agency flood modelling or records of historic flooding. Uh, that went out to 200 properties. We had around 50 responses. And there were questions around, uh, you know, around things like awareness of key guidance, such as English heritage's flooding and historic uh, buildings, awareness of policy in respect to those buildings and in respect to flooding, uh, the levels of reporting of these changes to relevant authorities such as conservation officers, HERs, English Heritage slash Historic England, critically the percept perspectives on the uh, historic environment profession, what they think of us and what they think we do, and to kind of quantify you know, kind of a, you know, what's happening to the form and the extent to which impact is occurring to these, these assets. So we also did a range of uh, flood walks, which asked the same questions, but targeting flood action groups. Uh, so community resilience group, community advocacy groups. That led to more one-to-one -one interviews to try and get, you know, drill a bit more down into those key issues. And then we also did, you know, additional things like analyzing, um, analyzing usage stats for uh, the main pieces of guidance out there. Right. So what did we find? Skip twice there. Okay. Number one is guidance. 
and there's a couple of really key issues that came out of this. The awareness of guidance, especially guidance such as the historic buildings, uh, flooding in historic building from the English heritage, is absolutely woeful within local communities. You're talking one in 20 being aware of it, and one in 40 actually using it. Now, to put it in some perspective, these aren't, this isn't just across the breadth of historic buildings. We're talking about listed buildings that have had serious impacts from flooding, and only one in 20 people are actually aware of the key guidance available to them. But this is in spite of a relatively strong framework of putting this information out there. We, um, I don't know how many of you know the climate change uh, website for Historic England. It's very good, it's very uh, well used, and it's very well resourced. But the documentation is very clearly not permeating beyond our sector to those who own the properties. It's staying within ourselves. We're having this circular conversation and producing arguments that circulates internally and isn't reaching the people that need it. We don't need it, they need it, and we need to sort that out. So why is this happening? Now, I think part of the key issue is actually quite fundamental to our sector as a whole. It is an issue of perception. It's a perception of the historic environment as a concept, and it's a perception of historic environment professionals as a practice. So, as a kind of example of how that, how that works, very few flood action groups that we engaged with had a real kind of concept that what they were dealing with was often historic environmental issues. The fact that the historic environment and heritage is fundamentally linked, as we've seen today, to issues of flooding and flood alleviation across the country. The Derwent is a fantastic example of that, but you can go beyond that to kind of, you know, the less kind of, uh, you know, the non-world heritage sites and the more vernacular landscapes. Flood, flood water management, uh, sorry, water management systems are prevalent across our country. Um, the Dutch example about drainage ditches crosses the country as well. The way we've used land, the way we've managed it, and the way that we've um, kind of changed that landscape is fundamental to how flood water moves across our, our nation, nation now. But that isn't recognised. And the interesting thing is, is flood action groups are going out and they're, they're surveying culverts and they're surveying sluices and weirs and they're surveying drainage ditches, but they don't see it as heritage. So they don't make the connection, so they don't seek the advice. They talk to hydrologists, but they don't talk to archaeologists. So perception of what's deemed historic and heritage is also an issue. It's still in you know, many communities linked to the designation system. If it's not designated, it's not historic, it's not heritage. I don't need to talk to an archaeologist. And that causes major issues about the perception of the role of the heritage practitioner and about what they do. It means that they see us as only someone who's uh, often people who deal with constraint and deal with issue. And effectively, uh, someone said in terms of about negativity, uh, we're people that come in and react to things. We're not someone to engage with in a proactive manner to talk about opportunities inherent in the, the building that you own. It puts, again, a higher proportion of, uh, a higher chance of poorly informed change. Uh, so change not informed by the experts like yourselves who understand the key dynamics of how, for example, a building responds to flood water and should be dried or and repaired in respect to it. And it puts a much greater risk to the property itself for its long-term conservation and sustainability. And it puts a much greater pressure on the owner and them at risk of greater fiscal impact when that building starts to fall apart because the repairs haven't been appropriate. Fundamentally, and this is the key issue, it means that there's a missed opportunity for um, a kind of cost-effective or more cost-effective engagement and uh, process of, of planning for, uh, for response and planning for mitigation. It means that they're missing the chance to have well-informed, good design within their property, whether that be to prevent flooding or to minimise the impact or repair because of it. Now, that's really important for buildings archaeologists because fundamentally it means you miss out on work. Now, I mean, I know that means sounds a little bit capitalist, but we're not putting an additional cost upon these individuals. This money is going to be spent. They have to, and they will, get consultants in to advise them on the re uh, repair or modification of their building. Now, that is not going, on the whole, to historic buildings archaeologists. That goes to them who come in and who survey and who react, but not who inform the design. And that's really key. There's a massive market here, which loads of people are profiting on, but buildings archaeologists aren't on the whole. They should be leading the design process, not, inf not commenting on it later down the line. 
Okay. The second issue, which kind of links in, is, is one of communication. Now, as mentioned, we, we wanted to ask, you know, what degree are they engaging with uh, curators of historic environment information and curators of what well, historic environment policy, effectively, through these processes of managing their asset? And generally, we found that it was, it was quite low and concerningly low, but not actually particularly different to many other areas of the historic environment. Now, there was, we found, a relatively low proportion of people and, and a low, relatively low desire uh, to report direct and indirect changes to properties, whether through damage or through modification, to the relevant authority, whether, whether that be a conservation officer, a historic environment record, or an inspector of um, historic buildings. Now, I find that very understandable, because if you're in your wellies and your house is being completely washed out, and this is your livelihood, and this is your home, Frankly, you're not going to give a damn about calling, you know, your local HDR and saying just to let you know I've taken the line plaster out, you know, we, uh, you know, please make a record of it. Understandably, you know, they're not. We're not going to expect them to do that. But there's an issue of a lack of awareness that, in the longer term, that that is a very productive thing to do. And why that's productive, and how can we justify that? And that's key. We can't just say please do this. We'd really like it, and we're not going to do it. The important thing is, is that the deficiency in that evidence base, our inability to collect the information of all this incremental change, means that our ability to plan and implement policy and appropriately curate the historic environment in the future is diminished. If we don't understand what's being changed, how it's being changed, and the extent to those changes, we can't inform future change going into the future. And secondly, for the academics out there, it's a very, it's a critical loss of information. You know, there's a huge amount of work going on in respect to climate change, but a, a small proportion is being reported to HERs, to conservation office and to English Heritage. We're not collating the resource that allows us to, you know, understand our architectural heritage. This is a massive move, driver for change in, our, in British architecture, but we're not reaping the benefits of it at a kind of information level. Secondly, is um, not common, but we found enough examples that make it kind of somewhat concerning, is that there's a fear that communicating with uh, heritage professionals is going to lead to a degree of reprisal. Again, it's an issue of perspective. There's the, the, the stereotype of local authority is bureaucratic and constraint-led, which is just a broader issue to get over. But again, it's the idea of heritage as hindrance, that, that by engaging with heritage professionals, it adds more constraint, it adds more fiscal pressure. But in reality, when we engaged with the people who were coming forward with this argument, we actually found it wasn't the case. It was, you know, it was a concern that, that wasn't really going to be put in place in practice, that the local conservation actually was very keen to help them out and to engage with them and to you know, kind of smooth through the planning process and say obtaining list of building consent for them to make the best use of their building and make sure that they can live in it comfortably for the future. And in terms of the kind of final point with communication, is, it's about fatigue. Frankly, has said, if you own a property that's at risk of flooding, it is tiring, and they are sick to death of you dealing with the environmental consultant, the heritage consultant, the conservation officer, the flood risk planner. We've got to get over that. We've got to get away from the idea that we're going to add more stress and more concerns to them. It's about engaging them in the idea of opportunity. What can we do for you? How can we help you protect your property? How can we help you get through the planning system? It's a key definition, and it's one that you know takes a bit of kind of realignment. But people appreciate it, and that's that's really important. So, just kind of illustrate the kind of you know the kind of full end of the spectrum of that. Um, this is a particular late 17th century cottage in Worcestershire. Um, they uh, requested that I always talk about it with full anonymity, but that's, you'll understand why in a minute. Um, and it's uh, grade two listed. It's one of the most significant buildings in this particular settlement. Um, and it's a beautiful late 17th century cottage. Unfortunately, what you're seeing there is pretty much a bit of a facade, and that's effectively the remnants of a 17th century cottage. The reason is, is that in 2007, the massive flood events that hit Worcestershire led to an enormous amount of damage to this property. Not directly from the flood water, but the need for the means of repair. Now this building housed the family, and it was their key point of livelihood. They, they ran their business out of it. So they've had to very rapidly replace the fabric, a, a huge range of fabrics, timbers, plastering. They had to do a substantial degree of excavation, both interior and exterior surfaces, to change all the, and to change the infrastructure. It needed to be done rapidly, it needed to be done cost-effectively to secure their livelihood. 
and to make sure that they effectively didn't become homeless. Now, that wasn't undertaken with any building consent. It wasn't undertaken with any direct consultation with the conservation officer because it had to be done immediately and the conservation officer had 200 properties calling up saying, I have damaged what I'm going to do. There wasn't the capacity to do it. Now, the problem is, is they haven't, they've actively avoided applying for retrospective consent. And furthermore, they've actively avoided engaging with English Heritage and the conservation officers because they fear of that there's going to be a reprisal. Basically, a misunderstanding of the system and how these processes work means that they don't want to engage with us. They don't want to take on further fiscal and personal stress for something that they see has been put behind them. This property has been passed down to the children in the family who are now have their own, you know, have their own children, and they're really concerned of, about revisiting this process. Now, in actuality, it wasn't true. We talked to the conservation officer, and this is no, we would have been really, you know, keen to get that worked out. And yes, they had to make some quite substantial modifications to the fabric, but that's fine. It was circumstance. It's an extreme example, but it's, it's the idea of the, that there can be a perception of threat when it comes to heritage. So it's about opportunity and it's about engagement. Okay, so capacity. You're thinking, oh God, he's going to talk about cuts again. But I'm going to talk about this a bit, little bit more positively. I can't stand up here and say, this is all because we've been cut. The government came along and slashed our budgets, and that's the reason. Rubbish. It's not. We can't do it. This was happening far before austerity and far before the financial crisis. What it does do is cause us problems of how to rectify these issues, how to readdress our engagement with owners of historic properties on the whole. So it curtails our ability to go out and do intensive engagement, intensive re-education. So how can we fix this? You know, how, can we, how can we try and address some of these issues? And we've had some real successes of this part of this project of doing so. First and foremost is making sure that we build capacity within non-historic environment specialists to identify key risks and key opportunities in respect to heritage and historic buildings. These are the people who are on the, on the front line who immediately respond to flooding and they need to be aware of what is a historic environment asset, whether that be a drainage ditch or whether it be a 1930s you know, social, house, uh, social housing scheme. They, they need a better understanding of that because they can't rely on us to give the, the necessary advice um, that you know, they require at the rate that they need it. They're up at four in the morning you know, pumping out drainage ditches. You know, they're not going to be able to acquire that advice. So we need new ways of doing so. We saw the, uh, the, the one about the kind of uh, the data set. That data set will be going out to uh, disaster planners to have on their GIS kind of tablets when, when, they, when they utilize it. But it's also about education. It's about making sure that they're aware of that guidance. They're aware of the key principles and they have the basic understanding of how to identify risk and opportunity. So when they talk to us, so they know how to filter all of that kind of risk and all of that damage and say, right, I need some help down here. Come down and give us a hand. Secondly, is to build capacity within community advocacy groups. Do not underestimate the power of these groups. This isn't nimbyism. This isn't just kind of you know uh, the village hall kind of monthly meeting to have a you know to uh, to you know whinge about dog mess. This is serious community advocacy. They are highly skilled, highly educated, and highly motivated groups who know a hell of a lot more than flood risk historic buildings than a lot of the people in this room. We have to respect that, and we have to be able to channel that towards a kind of productive outcome. They own these buildings, they occupy these buildings, and they know more than anyone else how to manage them. We need to be able to give them the tools to deliver that expertise in a kind of practical planning and kind of constructive way. An example of that uh, is in uh, the Isborne Catchment Group, which is funnily enough next to the River Isborne. And what they're doing there is, is, is really interesting. Again, these were the groups that were going around surveying historic landscapes, but not really realizing they're doing it. But we've done a little bit of training. We've talked to them about creating a basic record that is fit for purpose for a historic environment record. And they're going out, they're recording them, and they're feeding it back to the HER. So we're now getting an expanded record of drainage ditches, of water meadows, of, of uh, weirs, of ponds, of sluices, of leets across down the river Isborne catchment. Great. Small change, little bit of education, and we're getting a much better output from it. And thirdly, it's about, it's about partnership working. I know that's a bit of jargon, but it's, it is really important. Links into the first comment I made about building capacity in other agencies. It's about understanding that actually other services have to take the lead on conservation sometimes, including historic building conservation. 
that they are the, prime, the leader on, on these areas, so we have to support them. We can't be territorial. We can't sit in our own little niche and say, no, we are buildings archaeologists and we survey buildings. Actually, we can get them to do the basic level of recording. In the similar way, we, we often, when doing building surveys, look at, you know, you identify bats, you identify biodiversity. You know, you've got to, you've got to work a bit more flexibly. Uh, an example of how that's happening right now is in uh, Ribbon Hall and Gudley. Uh, this is a settlement uh, that's travelled uh, on the wire forest. Um, I don't know how many of you, you know it, but it travels either side of the watercourse and it has a massive impact from flooding. It has a huge range of, kind of 17th through early 20th century historic buildings, really distinctive townscape linked to a really important tourist economy. And they had a huge, huge problem with flooding. Until, and these are kind of these great things you can see going on the side, the environment agency said, right, we're going to trial something called a demantable barrier system. And what they do when there's a flood risk, they come along, they shove these big metal things in the, in the ground and they put these kind of you know, slats in and it works fantastically. It works really well. The, the buildings are protected. They're taking this away next year. It's the end of the pilot scheme. Um, they've decided uh, for reasons of effectively cost effectiveness that it is more cost effective uh, to go to something called property level protection, PLP, which is basically paying either to uh, repair individual buildings or protect them individually. Now, I'm not going to argue too much against that because they have serious fiscal constraints in the environment agency and they are often doing the best that they can do, but it's going to have a massive impact on local build historic buildings in that area. Hundreds of buildings potentially having massive structural you know, fabric ch changes to their structural fabric to facilitate this PLP approach. Now, of course, the local community are up in arms about this. They've had the last 10 years of security. They haven't had to worry about flooding. And suddenly you have someone knocking on your door saying, well, you might get protection, but actually it might become more cost effective for us to let you flood every year and then just pay for the repair. That's, you don't want that. And understandably, they're, they're mortified by this process. So it means there's less value in those historic properties and there's much less desire, fundamentally, for them to maintain them. What's the point? Why should I live here? So you get abandonment. You get loss of kind of value and economy and amenity. It has a much longer, you know, potential for a much broader impact than simply a case of, you know, kind of fiscal uh, recovery. Now, it's early days, but what's really interesting here is that the local conservation officer is starting to become the fulcrum around which negotiations occur. Now, PLP is going to come into place. We understand this. But by coming together, by trying to have a heritage-led approach, what's happening is that we're now looking at HLF schemes, looking at getting funding in to kind of promote a kind of more sustainable and a kind of, or, you know, potentially a, a, a kind of more permanent barrier system. It's a big if, but if they can convince HLF to fund that, those kind of works, you can protect a whole swathe of a really distinctive part of Worcestershire, but also alleviate flooding. It's about getting heritage as the driver for opportunity, getting, you know, getting in and talking about how these, you know, the, the opportunity can emerge from engaging with us. It isn't just about constraint. We can point to ways in which you can achieve the but you know outcomes for both sides. It's about trying to mediate between the various organizations. And going way back to what I was saying before about trying to convince people that we are actually a service who can inform design, that can do some things really proactively, we're gonna to have to do that more more often to try and get in the middle and to mediate between people. Um, try not to be, I think, what was it, the Jupiter, as you, you said before, and trying to get somewhere in the middle of that solar system. <laughs> okay, so loads of issues. So that, I apologise, it's all miserable. That was the brief. It was like one of the challenges. So um, yeah, blame historic English. <laughs> yeah, but the um, the key is one of the key outputs was uh, to provide recommendations to historic England. So I just thought I'd you know to end up I'd flag up where we've recommended that they go forward. They don't have to take these on, but this is what we think is a good starting point to try and rectify some of these challenges. Number one, and first and foremost, is to instigate a new marking initiative for guidance um, to the target audience that needs to use them, such as the flooding and historic buildings. Get beyond the, the heritage sector and push it beyond those processes. Find ways of getting this to people, whether it's just a mail drop or whether it's some form of kind of you know, social media drive. Get people in who know how to market these products. We can't just sign them off and say that'll do, because it doesn't go beyond basically people in this room. One area that we didn't look at, this was very community to local authority driven, uh, was uh, contractors. Now, of course, contractors are key forces for change. I know one of our other product, projects as part of the broader activity is looking at this more closely. 
Um, but we need more information. We need to quantify to what extent non-heritage contractors are using our guidance, using our information, and try to, again, market that information and market the skills of buildings archaeologists and historic environment specialists more broadly. We'd really like to see a helm training event aimed at both heritage and non-heritage practitioners um, about supporting communities and building capacity and resilience. I think that could be really important. And again, we want to see a kind of more formal kind of um, you know, drive to explore the uh, new mechanisms of reporting change to the historic environment and archaeological assets, you know, looking at places like the Isborne Catchment Group and look at what they're doing. And finally, I think there's real value to commission new pilot studies on that, on that ground using the regional capacity budgets to try and build capacity and resilience in these groups. Again, find rapid means of assessing that these groups can go out and record a building, record an archaeological asset and feed it back to a historic environment record. Now, the key kind of message, the kind of way to finish off, is that, yes, I've talked about a lot of issues today, but none of them are insurmountable. If you really just think about them, it's little tweaks in the way we do things. It's changing perspectives. And actually, it's, it's a big endeavor, but it has you know, real potential to really you know, change the way we engage with these processes. So that's me. Um, 31 minutes, apologize, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you.